afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. Um, this webinar is hosted by Esquire Group. My name is Reiner Figa Coleman, and today we will be talking about undisclosed foreign income or assets. Which IRS amnesty program is right for you? A little background about myself. Um, I am a IRS enrolled agent. I have a bachelor's in international management engineering, as well as a master's in international management with an emphasis in taxation. Um, I am a tax associate here at Esquire Group. We are a international tax advisory firm. I've worked in Asia, Europe, the United States. My background is I'm, I'm German American. Um, I've been here at Esquire Group for about three years now. We specialize in international taxation, specifically tax issues facing US citizens and resident aliens living abroad. And we also deal with to topics such as expatriation, for an unreported income and assets, like we are talking about today, uh, investing or doing business abroad, and foreign investment in the United States. If you want my full bio, you can read it on our website. Let's jump into the content of today's presentation. First of all, let's clarify who U.S. tax laws apply to. The easiest one to determine is if you are a US citizen. So you became a naturalized citizen, you inherited it from your parents, or you were born in the US. If you are a citizen and you hold a passport, US laws, US tax laws apply to you. The second category are US permanent residents, or also known as green card holders. And the third classification is if you pass the substantial presence test. This is essentially your tax residency in the United States is uh, accomplished by spending too many days in the United States. So this is determined by your physical presence in the United States. Um, this is determined by a formula. It is the current year. So so the year that you're trying to calculate this for, so let's take 2016, for example, it is all of the years you spent in the United States in 2016, plus one third of the days you spent in the year before that. So in this case, 2015, plus a sixth of the days you spent the year before that. So if you spent 100 days in the United States uh, in 2016, 15, and 2014, 100 days each year, you would take uh, 100 for 2016 plus 33 and a third for 2015 and 16 and two thirds for 2014. And this would come out to right around 150. Um, and this is the number that you would use then in the substantial presence test. So let's talk a little bit about the basic filing requirements for US citizens and residents. Um, the first is the most basic and probably what you're familiar with is your US income tax return. Um, this is where your worldwide income needs to be reported. This is just something to be aware of. It is essentially irrelevant if you live in the United States or abroad. If you're a US person, your worldwide income needs to be reported. So this is, if it's abroad or in the United States, it still needs to be disclosed. The second uh, filing requirement is the foreign bank account report, also known as the FBAR. This is not a income tax return. This is more of a disclosure form where you need to report any bank accounts or any non-US financial accounts in which you have signatory authority or financial interest. And the third category are international information returns. These are either submitted with your personal tax return, it's a, submitted as an attachment, or they are filed independently. These include forms such as 49, form, 48, for, form 8938 to report your foreign financial assets, or if you are the director or shareholder in a foreign corporation, if you're a partner in a foreign partnership, you're the owner of a foreign disregarded entity, or you're the grantor or beneficiary of a foreign trust, or if you're the shareholder in a passive foreign investment company, also known as a PFIC. These are all different situations which have their own informational returns, which you may need to file if you meet the requirements. So let's start talking about the variety of options, which are the, the different situations in which you may enter into an amnesty program 
and to the different criteria we'll be discussing today. The first is what it do you, what do you do if you haven't been filing your US taxes, FBARs or other reporting forms? What do you do if you've uh, realize you have been making mistakes on your returns. Are there any penalties involved? Will you be charged with a crime? And how will the U.S. find out about your foreign accounts if you don't report them? So let's now jump into the first amnesty program, which we'll be discussing today. The first one is the Offshore Voluntary Disclosure Program. This is the most rigorous and it's a most intensive of these programs in that it has the largest number of years which need to be filed. First of all, this is for individuals who have intentionally failed to comply. This intentionally failed to comply means you generally did something wrong knowing that it was wrong. Either someone was hiding money abroad or on purpose not reporting certain income on their tax returns. A, a good example for, for this program is someone that has a foreign offshore company and has been doing investments in that company and they've, they've, they've received dividends and interest and that's sitting in an offshore account in a company name and they've never disclosed it in the United States. They've never paid tax on this income. They've essentially intentionally tried to hide this income and the assets. So the eligibility for this program is that the funds obtained or the funds invested in the undisclosed, undisclosed assets needed to have been legally obtained or a legal income source. Additionally, you cannot participate in the OVDP if you have already made a submission pursuant to the streamline procedures, which we'll be talking about next. So if you've made a submission to the streamlines, you can't then change your mind and redo another submission into the OVDP. As a general requirement for all of the amnesty programs is that you cannot be under civil examination or criminal investigation by the IRS. IRS. So essentially, the IRS cannot have an open file for you regarding the uh, anything to do with uh, the OVDP program. So how do you actually participate in this program? The procedure to go through it is quite lengthy and expensive, especially the, this OVDP program. You need to file or amend up to eight years of tax returns. So this is correcting your returns to include all of the unreported income including the informational returns that might have been omitted, really going through those eight years and making sure that the tax returns are perfect and including all income, all assets, all four corporations and information is, is properly uh, disclosed. The second requirement is that you need to file or amend up to the eight years of FBARs, the foreign bank account report. So all bank accounts that you have financial interest in or signatory authority and need to be disclosed in this procedure. Additionally, you need to pay all back tax, all back taxes and the interest and penalties on that tax. The interest and penalties are calculated from when the tax would have been due. So if you're going back eight years, the interest and penalties can definitely add up fairly quickly. Additionally, the OVDP has a OVDP penalty. This is calculated based on the highest value of unreported assets. So this eight year time window is looked at and the one point in time where the maximum amount of assets which were unreported existed is used to calculate the penalty. And then it's a 27.5% and or 50% penalty of this unreported, of the total unreported assets. The simple example, if you had a one foreign account with $100,000 in it, which was never reported, and 100000 was the maximum balance during these eight years, the penalty would either be 27500 or 50000 Penalty depends on with which financial institution the assets were held. Additionally, the OVDP requires you to disclose other information in a series of questionnaires. These are primarily uh, background information and the history of the, the funds and the assets which have been unreported. It's it, information like um, who you had contact with at your bank, what type of advice you receive, where the funds came from. It's, it's really background information as to give the IRS a more detailed and a more overall picture of your submission. Um, I do want to point out that the OVDP 
is a agreement in which you you sign an agreement with the IRS. It is a black and white document that you receive that states the conditions of your agreement that you know you won't be prosecuted that once you have properly disclosed the OVD all of the the funds and and income in the OVDP it really stipulates the conditions of the agreement and you get a, a black and white physical tangible document from the IRS. This is something that does not exist in all of the programs so this is one thing that makes the OVDP unique is that you actually enter into a, a, a agreement with the IRS. The next uh, filing procedures I will be talking about are the streamlined procedures, different streamlined procedures. There's the streamlined foreign offshore and the streamlined domestic offshore. Um, they are very similar but have some key differences. The first one, the foreign offshore procedure, this is for U.S. residents abroad who non willfully failed to comply. So the first eligibility requirement is failure to comply was non-willful. Non-willful is a very, very key term in the streamlining procedures. Non-willful essentially means that your behavior was unintentional. It was not done on purpose. It's that you have a reason for not properly having filed your returns. So uh, simple examples of this are items such as you received false tax advice. You know, you had a, a CPA who told you you don't need to disclose this information someone that was just not familiar with international rules, and then you followed their instructions, which led you coming into non-compliance. Or if you simply did not know that these forms existed or that you didn't have a filing requirement. So if you were under the impression that you were doing everything correctly and then you found out that you were doing it incorrectly, um, these are examples where you might qualify for the program. So, so you really, it had to have been an accident. It wasn't intentional behavior. The second criteria is that you meet the non-residency requirement. To participate in the foreign streamlined procedure, you needed to have spent enough time in a foreign country to participate. So if you don't meet the non-residency requirement, you would then either need to participate in the domestic filing procedures or one of the other options. The third requirement is that you failed to report and pay tax on income from foreign financial assets. This is another key sentence that needs to be read very carefully. Income from foreign financial assets. Foreign wages, so as in salary you received for a job, is not income from a foreign financial asset. So if your only income was from your employer for your normal job, for example, and you did not have any income from a foreign financial asset, you would not qualify for this program. Income from foreign from foreign financial assets includes interest on a bank account, dividends, um, capital gains from the foreign securities account, things like this. Um, and as I previously mentioned, you cannot be under examination or investigation by the IRS. You cannot have an open examination into your case and then try and enter into one of these programs. So how do you actually participate in this program? The first and foremost is to file or amend three years of tax returns. For the tax returns and the FBARs, you need to file. The, so the first year that you need to file in the procedure is the year for which the tax return deadline has already passed. So if you were living outside of the United States, now it is April 2017. If you live outside of the United States, you automatically have an extension to file up until June 15th. 2017. So your 2016 tax return is technically not due yet. So you could file your 2016 return still timely, therefore it's not past due, therefore it cannot be included in the streamlined foreign offshore procedure. So the first year which would be included in this procedure is 2015 and then you would work backwards. So for the F, uh, sorry, for the tax returns you would file three years. So it would be 2015, 2014, 2013. Then you would need to also include for the FBARs three additional years. So it would be 2012, 11, and 10 in this to complete uh, six, year, six years of FBARs. In addition, you would need to pay a, all the back taxes and interest for the, the tax returns. So for the three years that you're preparing the tax returns, the, any tax that's due, you need to pay, as well as the interest on them. I do want to point out that in the streamlined filing procedures, 
the failure to pay and failure to file penalties are not assessed. So if you owe tax, there often can be large financial benefit by participating in the streamlined procedures um, if you qualify because these penalties are not assessed. Um, so this is one large benefit. Additionally, the taxpayer is required to sign a certification. This is a statement of facts that goes with your with your tax returns. It essentially explains your situation to the IRS. It gives a bit of background information, why you didn't file, how you misunderstood the tax rules, also where your funds came from, what kind of assets were not reported, a little background information as to your situation and gives the IRS more of a complete picture uh, in your submission. This, the, the streamlined filing, the streamlined foreign offshore filing procedure does not have any penalties. So there's no financial penalty for participating in the program. Um, while you owe the taxes interest, you're actually receiving a special treatment because you are not paying the failure to file and failure to pay penalties. So the next procedure is the streamlined domestic offshore procedure. This is very similar to the one I just discussed, the streamlined foreign offshore procedure, but this is for people who did not meet the non-residency requirements. So it has the same non-willful component, so you can only participate in this program if your behavior was non-willful, so non-intentional, you didn't um, intentionally hide assets or funds. Um, you could not have, so in order to participate in the domestic program, you would essentially have not qualified for the non-residency requirement in the offshore procedure. So if you live full-time in the United States, you can qualify for this program. Or if you live abroad and you spend too many days in the United States and you don't qualify for the streamlined foreign Streamlined domestic um, might be an option. You also needed to have previously filed the three years of, of returns, which you are amending. So in this procedure, if you didn't file original tax returns, you cannot participate because you can only amend returns in this procedure. You cannot file them as original. Same component as the streamlined offshore is you needed to fail to report and pay tax on income from a foreign financial asset. So again, foreign wages would not count in this case. It needs to be income from an asset. And if you're under examination or investigation, you also cannot participate. So the requirements are um, very similar to the streamlined offshore, the streamlined foreign, sorry, is you need to amend those three years of tax returns for which they are past due. So right now, um, if you were in the United States, for example, and you did, right, it's April 19th as of today. So the the April filing deadline for U.S. residents has passed. Um, so if you didn't file an extension, your 2016 return would be past due. So if you already filed your 2016, that would actually be included in this submission procedure. So it could be that you are including 2016 15 and 14 in this case. If you haven't filed your 16 return yet and it's on extension, you may need to push it back here and do 2013, 14, 15 tax returns for the streamlined domestic. Um, this would need to be looked at uh, more carefully depending exactly when you're filing. Additionally, it also has the same th six years of FBARs, so any unreported accounts need to be disclosed. You need to pay all back taxes and interest. Again, you do not have the failure to pay and failure to file penalties. It has the same or very similar certification, which needs to be signed, including a statement of facts with the background information as to your situation. And in the streamlined domestic, there is also a 5% penalty based on the highest value of unreported assets. So similar to the OVDP penalty, but it is 5%. So the whole three years, or actually six years, are looked at. So the, the one point in time where the most point in time where the highest value of unreported assets existed is used to calculate that penalty. Um, this completes the streamline filing procedures and we will now move on to the delinquent FBAR submission procedure. This is unique in that it only includes the FBARs. Um, so your income tax returns would needed to have properly been reported in order to participate in this program. 
You could not have omitted any income or tax in order to, to participate in this program. So it's only for people who have properly reported and paid all tax on all income, but did not file the F bar. So you could not have, if you omitted any income on your tax return, you would not qualify to participate in this program. Secondly, you could not have previously filed F bars and participate in this. So if you filed two years of F bars and then didn't file for several years just because you couldn't be bothered or you forgot, you would also be disqualified from participating because you had already previously filed F bars. You cannot be under examination or investigation by the IRS. You can also not have been contacted by the IRS regarding these delinquent F bars. Again, essentially, if you have an open case with the IRS, you probably don't qualify. How do you participate in this program? Well, you need to go back and file the delinquent F bars. You need to explain the reason for late filing in a statement which gets submitted with the tax return, uh, with the F bars, just your reasoning and your reasoning as to why you did not properly file and why, why this was. And there's no penalty for participating in this program. So there's no financial burden when it comes to participating in the F bar, delinquent F bar submission procedure. Let's move on now to the delinquent international information return submission procedure. This is very similar to the delinquent F bar procedure, but for informational returns. So this is for people who reported and paid tax on all income, but failed to file international information returns. These are forms that I discussed earlier in our presentation. The most common are forms for foreign financial assets, like Form 8938, or if you have a foreign corporation, Form 5471, or if you formed a foreign trust, Form 3520 and 3520A. They are informational returns that you did not include in your original submission, but the key requirement here is that you reported and paid tax on all income. So your, your income tax liability cannot change by, by fixing these returns. So if you, if you had income that was also omitted, you would not qualify for this program. Um, in order to participate in this program, you also need a reasonable cause. This is similar to non-willful behavior. Uh, essentially, you need to have a valid reason for, for not having properly filed the forms. This would include things like having received false tax advice, from someone that didn't understand the rules properly or you misunderstood the tax code or you you didn't know that you had a foreign corporation or you you were unaware that your interest required it to be reported but again your income needed to have all must have had all been properly reported and all tax needed to have been paid on that tax um, as all of these programs you also cannot be under examination or investigation and you cannot could not have been contacted by the IRS about the delinquent returns. How do you participate in this program? Well, you need to file the delinquent international information returns. There are some forms which either get filed on their own, as in independent return, or there are also several forms which get submitted with your personal income tax return. This is the case you would need to file an amended tax return along with the delinquent international information returns. So even if your tax liability doesn't change, you need to file that amended return in order to submit the informational return, which gets attached to personal return. Additionally, you need to include a statement establishing the reasonable cause for failure to file. This is the background information and explanation as to how you misunderstood the rules or where you received false tax advice. It explains your scenario and gives the IRS better understanding of why, why you failed to file. So this now completes the official IRS amnesty programs. Um, I want to shortly discuss the so-called quiet disclosures. This is not an IRS sanctioned amnesty program. There are no official guidelines or publications on it. It comprises of filing and amending the past tax returns, FBARs, or informational returns. It's essentially going back a fixed number of years and, and fixing everything. 
to come into compliance. It has a few advantages and disadvantages. The, the main advantage is that you potentially avoid penalties that exist in the other amnesty programs. So the OVDP, for example, rather than paying the fixed ODP penalty, a quiet disclosure wouldn't have this because it is not a official program that has a fixed penalty. The disadvantage of this program, the quiet disclosure concept, is that you have the potential of paying higher penalties than the sanctioned amnesty programs. For example, it could easily be that if you got assessed on the maximum FBAR penalties, that the total penalties between all of the years that it's assessed could be much more expensive than having participated in one of the programs and paying one of the penalties which is published by the IRS. So the, the, the FBAR is a good example because it can easily happen that if you were assessed with the maximum penalties on multiple years, that the the penalty can easily be 300% of what the maximum balance in the account was because if they assess the penalty on multiple years. Additionally, it does not protect you against criminal charges. So this completes our presentation for today. I hope I provided some insights into the different amnesty programs and hopefully provided some clarifications if you were unclear about the, the amnesty programs. If you have any questions or want to schedule a consultation or need tax advice, feel free to email us to schedule a consultation. We do also have quite a bit of uh, information guides, uh, articles, and other webinar recordings on our website. So I encourage you to visit us at esquiregroup.com. Um, we do also host other webinars fairly frequently and have a newsletter which provides various information on international tax issues. So I encourage you to sign up those uh, mailing lists. And thank you again for your time.